Anyways, the next talk will be uh, by Anne, who uh, you might probably all know. Her husband was uh, prosecuted by because of it because he had access to a library and um, he was sort of intellectual. He had knowledge, and um, you know you probably have read all these uh, formulations. They, they the the the, the uh, things they suggested. But um, this talk will actually not be very much about him. him. It will, will be about other cases all over the world. Um, where similarly terrorist uh, laws have been applied to prosecute innocent citizens or basically drastically misused. And um, this misuse is quite a danger for society, I think. And uh, I guess this will be very interesting because I, I don't think much has been publicized on that yet. So I hope you enjoy the talk and um, please clear the, the, the pathways. That would be, be very, very great. Anyways, have fun. Hi, and thank you all for coming. And uh, please don't pose any further security threats. We'll be talking enough about um, other dangers for security today. Um, maybe some of you saw me here last year when I talked about the case against Andre Holm, who's not my husband but my partner, which doesn't really make much of a difference. Um, and. Um, Last year I was quite shocked about um, having experienced uh, such an arrest uh, in the family and a terrorism charge and um, by now I'm not much less shocked but slightly used to the fact and uh, in the course of the last year I have um, of course focused myself a lot of, on cases of terrorism and um, in the time I noticed that there's many such cases and um, I would like to introduce some of these to you today because I think there's many others who are similarly um, strange and, and absurd in the way they are being run and not all of them have so much public attention. I think that the public perception of what terrorism is um, generally goes along rather with, the, with what actually the current EU definition of terrorism is. This definition of 2002 says um, terrorism, um, terrorism um, offenses are committed with the aim of uh, seriously intimidating a population or unduly compelling a government or international organization to perform or abstain from performing an act or seriously destabilizing or destroying the fundamental political, constitutional, economic or social structures of a country or an international organization. I think the general perception of terrorism is that um, involves um, massive violence against people, many deaths um, and, and probably some kind of, of situation that creates danger for a government or a state in itself. The cases um, that I'm going to talk to you about don't fit that description very well in my perception. I would like to say though that of course um, that the information that I have about these cases is not complete. In most cases the investigation is still going on. Um, it's not quite clear what really happened and um, the, still the investigation is running and the files are generally not public so I will inform, tell you the best of what I know but, but um, it may not be the complete information that we might find out about later when the cases will be closed eventually, I hope so. And of course um, in cases like this um, political views are involved and there's often many different views, specifically um, differences between the prosecution and the, and the defendants and um, I will also, of course, leave out some of the details because I will just give a basic overview of what is going on. The first case I would like to talk about is a case um, that um, took place um, in Nottingham, Great Britain, where um, in, on May 14th of this year, um, two members of the university were arrested under the Terrorism Act of 2000 of Great Britain. Their names are Hicham Yeza and Rizwan Sabir. And they were arrested because they had copies of the Al-Qaeda training manual on their computers. 
One of the two had downloaded this from the United States Department of Justice website. He's a member of the university's politics and international relations department. He was researching terrorism for his postgraduate studies. He was writing a PhD on the strategies of Al-Qaeda. He asked his friend and colleague Hicham, who is a former student and now works at the university, to help him with his PhD and specifically with printing out the huge document. Hicham, who's a who used to be a member of the Senate of the Nottingham University, who is an editor of different magazine, now worked for the university in the administration and um, both were arrested and held in police custody for six days before they were released without a charge. The charge to begin with was, um, was terrorism, like I said. It was then decided to not charge Hicham, who was mostly accused of the two under the Terrorism Act. But when they were released after six days, he was rearrested for charges under the Immigration Act. It was also said later that if both had been maybe of Norwegian origin and maybe were blonde, then probably this wouldn't have been such a problem, but being of Arabic uh, background, um, they completely fitted the stereotype of Muslim terrorists in the United um, Kingdom. He was rearrested under the Immigration Act and an order for fast-track deportation was issued on May 23rd and a deportation flight was scheduled for June 1st. This is two weeks after his first arrest. He had been in the UK for 13 years of residence and now had a planned deportation in less than three weeks after the arrest for the, uh, under the Terrorism Act. He was then moved around for three weeks from one immigration removal center to the next and after a huge protest campaign of which you can see one picture which was quite impressive I find, he was released on bail. As far as I know, the investigation concerning his uh, possible problems with immigration laws is still going on. On the website um, of the campaign, there is no complete up-to-date information as to what the situation is now, but I found it rather striking that, um, that they were arrested to begin with. Rizwan, the one who had downloaded the manual, later said in an interview, if they had just asked my professor why I was looking at this material, they would have understood that it was research. Instead, they chose to start an anti-terror investigation. What struck me in this case is, is a similarity to the case that, that we are as a family confronted with, uh, which is that, that also here an academic is, is concerned and um, a nice similarity is that there was a huge wave of support, the biggest demonstration ever that took place at the University of Nottingham um, uh, was taking place for his support and, and it is widely believed that this public support also helped um, to, to release and to drop the charges for terrorism. The next case I would like to talk about um, is a case that um, took place or is actually still taking place in Portugal. This is the, the British suspect. And the case in Portugal um, is a case against 150 activists who in the August of 2007 destroyed a field of genetically mod modified corn plants of one hectare in size. This field uh, is located in the region of Algarve, the first region in Portugal that was declared GMO-free by local authorities. It was the first time this kind of action was being carried out in Portugal. Um, in other countries, this takes place more often, particularly in Germany, this kind of so-called mowing of GMO plant uh, fields is, is actually quite common. It is considered more an action of civil disobedience, not necessarily by the owners of the fields, but by the activists. It is not considered a majorly violent action, but, but is um, tried to be seen as civil disobedience against, against something that, that is hard to protest against, which is genetically modified organisms being used now and endangering nature. This action took place during the day with press present and until today there is a video online with a documentation of the action and reactions by the public and especially the owner of the field. It is in no way what you would expect to be a terrorist action that is hidden in the, in the dark where it's impossible to identify anyone and, and impossible to really see what was going on. The video I find extremely interesting to see because it also includes um, many statements of the people who were involved. 
After, after this happened, there were strong reactions in the Portuguese media. The owner of the field received a visit by the Minister of Agriculture, by the Minister of Internal Affairs, who promised investigations, and by the President of the Portuguese Republic, who condemned the action and announced it must be punished. In September, the investigation went on. Um, so far, there are no formal charges, but um, uh, they are being threatened against the activists who don't really know what, what they will be facing and the action was classified by the government as terrorism and, um, and in result um, also by Europol who is collecting st and, and doing statistics on cases of terrorism in the European Union. Europol said that um, in other cases that, 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 that are falling in these fields of so-called single-issue activities. Terrorism cases are, are divided into left-wing terrorism, right-wing terrorism, Muslim fundamentalist terrorism, and then there's a so-called single-issue terrorism. Um, and, and normally these cases of single-issue activities are declared to be extremist, but not terrorism. Portugal chose um, to have this, um, the first case to be um, investigated under the new Portuguese law against terrorism. Um, to, to have their first case of, of terrorism also, and so um, the only case of, of terrorism in Portugal that uh, is reported in the Europol report um, for 2007 is, is this case of 150 activists who during the day trampled across a cornfield. Um, there is one other case which is of right-wing extremism, which is an entirely different matter, of course. This case doesn't really have much similarity to the case against Andre Holm, but um, Basically, it's, it's, um, it's a form of action that, what that's maybe similar that or, or vaguely similar that um, is, is labeled terrorism, which, which normally is not that uncommon. Um, it's, it's the first time in Portugal that something like this happened, and it is quite obvious that the activists didn't expect this kind of reaction. They did not expect to be uh, prosecuted as, as terrorists. And um, one could argue that the actions of the militant group, which is what Andre is still accused to, to be a member of, um, are also mostly symbolic actions. It's not violence against people nobody was ever hurt. It's mostly paint bombs against, for example, unemployment agencies, cars being burned, or minor property damage. Um, the next case I would like to talk about is a case that took place in Austria, also in May this year, when 10 people were arrested through armed police in Vienna. According to the Austrian uh, paragraph 278a of the Austrian Penal Code, which um, is the law that punishes forming a criminal organization, which was introduced already in 1993. This is the only case that doesn't directly involve terrorism but has many similarities nonetheless. 23 apartments, houses and offices were searched, doors were kicked in by masked officers with weapons drawn. And the cause for the arrests were uh, called the danger of suppression of evidence and the danger of committing a crime. Suppression of evidence uh, was seen as a danger because some of the suspects had used encryption and might do so again. Danger of committing a crime uh, was seen in the fact that some of the suspects had been politically active around issues of animal rights or animal protection. There is um, not visible any clear evidence um, that the suspects were actually involved in the attacks that they were accused of, and, and these attacks are um, the first strong uh, case uh, they were accused of having participated in was an assumed arson attack against a hunting lodge and in fact it was found out later that this was caused by, a, by an oven of this lodge which didn't work properly and the other things that are left in the investigation now are mostly things like broken windows or glue and some door locks, graffiti, sabotaged deer stands. Uh, they were accused of sabotage of animal hunting and, and in fact what, what happened was that people made noise during, during animal hunting and this is a sabotage. Also, there were several stink bombs against fur-selling stores. Um, all ten activists openly admit that they are engaged in either animal rights groups or animal protection groups. And um, that, that's an interesting thing also. They are accused of being a criminal organization, 
10 people, but uh, the 10 people that were arrested are um, part of two very different groups who actually don't like each other very much for ideological reasons. One are the more, um, you might say, radical animal rights activists, and, and the other is the more NGO type animal protection group that, that do lobbying, also demonstrations, but in a, in a nicer way if you want. The evidence that was found were tools that you can find in any household, mobile phones, t-shirts with logos, spray paints, which, which is a proof of their political activism. Um, and the interesting thing also in this case is that this, this kind of Austrian criminal organization needs at least 10 people so that a criminal organization can be, can be um, seen and 10 people were arrested. They didn't all know each other, they definitely don't like each other all very well, but they are one criminal organization. <laughs> this uh, paragraph 278a, I was told by some of the activists I met in, in fall of this year, um, is designed to prosecute organizations regarded as organized crime. Most countries have laws like this and, and specifically was used mostly like, like mafia-like organizations um, so far and it was the first time it was used against political activists. Everyone was arrested in May, like I said, and they were actually in pretrial detention for three months except for one person who was released one month earlier for, for no visible evidence other than, like I said, um, using encryption and, and similarly hard evidence. Um, the similarity here may be same as this for Andre is that there was no real evidence presented. The, the evidence that was used is mostly, if you want, ideological. They were accused of having been active around animal rights and, and this was apparently enough to then start an investigation with a lot of surveillance and observation in the months before, which led to gathering of little bits and pieces that um, are the, the said um, spray paint or logos or involvement in demonstrations, etc. Andre did a talk about his own case, I think in April or March of, of this year, and there was someone from Austria in the audience who, who then said, my God, this is terrible that you have something like this happening in Germany. I'm glad that I live in a kind of, of innocent paradise where this would never happen. And in May, he got an email by the same person saying, okay, I need to take this back because now we've also had the same thing in Austria. Um, like I said, everybody was released. Um, the charges are still being investigated and it's unclear what is going to become of, of these 10 people who um, have spent three months in prison basically for, I would say, well, not nothing but not very much. The next uh, case I would like to talk about took place in New Zealand, where in October of 2007, um, more than 300 special forces police um, did raids in, in dozens of houses um, all over New Zealand, um, mostly in Maori. Um, this is the indigenous communities of New Zealand. This included, for example, a school bus um, of, of kindergarten kids that was um, stopped and searched with drawn weapons, um, 60 houses being searched, a complete village being shut off. And um, the police said this was the response to concrete terrorist threats by indigenous activists. The result was 12 arrests under the recently created anti-terrorism legislation. And um, after the arrests, the Solicitor General, which is the vice state prosecutor of New Zealand, um, actually decided that, that um, this could not be a terrorism charge with the evidence that was presented, but it was in the media and, and for, the, um, for the arrested first presented as now you are being charged with the Terrorism Act. Um, arrests were being made nonetheless, um, but after four weeks all 12 were released. Today, eight people face charges under the Arms Act for alleged participation in paramilitary-style training camps, and five people are also charged with being members of an organized criminal group. It also needs to be said here that New Zealand passed a new anti-terror uh, law after 9-11, and this was the first case that was being tried under this new anti-terrorism law of um, New Zealand. Um, 
the terrorism charge was not accepted, but the Arms Act, if, if they would be judged by that, would lead to four years of prison and the, the criminal organization would um, result in, at, in up to five years of prison. The current situation is that pre-trial hearings are going on, which um, is a legal, well, all countries have different legal situations and many of the Anglo-Saxon countries have, have this thing where they have pre-trial hearings and, and only then it is decided whether a formal trial is actually started in court. And this is going on in New Zealand now uh, for months already and um, the people who are concerned say that uh, they expect the trial maybe to start in the end of 2009. Interesting detail I find is that, um, since I'm talking to a, to a Chaos Congress here, that um, the police think that um, an encrypted chat room was used to organize the training camps and, and this encrypted chat is, is to be found at http um, blah, 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 slash slash voodoo chat dot net. Um, and, and the police apparently didn't manage to break into this chat and therefore thinks that this is a highly conspiratorial method to organize very dangerous things um, just because they couldn't open it. They have no idea of what actually was talked about or, or organized in this. Also in the raids, several servers were confiscated with the result that different Maori websites um, disappeared and are not back online until today. Um, the public attention in this case in New Zealand was rather high, obviously. Um, I, I remember finding um, media reports also in German or, or different media outside New Zealand about this case, but the attention decreased naturally after the de decision not to charge under the Terrorism Act. The investigation is, is still going on though, and, and the possible sentences that might come out of this are quite hard. Um, what is interesting in the context of New Zealand that last week um, it became known that um, a police informant was um, revealed, was, um, how to say, un uncovered, um, who had informed police about animal rights groups, environmental groups, unions, peace groups and the Green Party. Um, his reports include not only um, details about communication methods, but also phone numbers, demonstra demonstration plans, etc., but also information on sexu sexual relationships, travel plans, or sources of income. This is not very surprising. I mean, we all probably assume that police are using informants in, in any kind of community that they consider of interest for whatever reason, so that's not really surprising, but I find it rather rare that, that it is um, possible to, to actually find out details about how this work is being done, and it's actually quite interesting how this, how this was done. Um, this person who had been an informant for more than 10 years in the New Zealand activist communities had, a, had, had his computer broken and um, asked his girlfriend, who's a computer programmer, to fix his computer. She found strange emails on his computer that he apparently didn't bother to hide very well and installed some spyware on his phone to monitor his text messages and calls and set a script on his computer to continue sending his emails to her. She even downloaded a year's worth of phone bills and decrypted documents he had encrypted and as a result it became clear that he was communicating and working for the police. The similarity in this case um, to, to the case against Andre and the militant group in Germany is that um, in the beginning there was a huge public attention and this is a similarity in many of these cases as long as it is a terrorism case and after the terrorism charge um, drops people seem to think okay so now we, we are back to legal democratic law state kind of structures and everything is fine but in fact investigations are still going on but under a different um, paragraph of the panel code. This is from a demonstration from the support groups in New Zealand. Next, I would like to talk about the United States. In the United States, something is, is going on that is labeled um, the Green Scare to describe legal actions of the US government against environmental and animal rights activists in the United States. The FBI calls them animal rights extremists and eco-terrorists. It's, it's a term similar to, to what was used during the McCarthy era in the 50s, the Red Scare. The topic, the topic eco-terrorism appeared in 2002 in a hearing in Congress 
the US Congress. And um, since 2000, there have been more than 20 cases of, of investigations and trials. Two groups are the main targets um, of the Green Scare, and they are the Animal Liberation Front, the ALF, and the Earth Liberation Front, the ELF. Their actions comprise um, what could be described as politically motivated property destruction, including large financial damage, e.g. arson to luxury villas seen as symbols of excessive consumerism, lumber companies, destructions of SUVs, um, releasing animals from fur farms, damage of e.g. telephone towers and, and many other different things. The ELF, the Earth Liberation Front, was made the number one of the domestic terrorist threat list by the FBI. I am quoting now, the number one domestic terrorism threat is the eco-terrorism and animal rights movement. This is a quote from CNN. Now, we are not talking about Al-Qaeda here or Muslim fundamentalism. This is um, animal rights act activists with doing a lot of damage. Some of the examples of, of cases um, that, that were uh, put on trial here is a rather famous person. His name is Jeff Lures. Um, he was convicted to 23 years of jail um, because he set three SUVs on fire. SUVs are these suburban vehicles, these huge cars that are now riding around everywhere that use a lot of, of, of gas um, and actually are not really a good example of environmental um, way of living. Um, he did this, so he said, as a protest against excessive consumption and global warming in 2000 and 2001, when this was not yet a very prominent um, topic of debate. He was sentenced to 23 years of jail for this, and this was later reduced to 10 years. He is still in prison. Another example is, is what's called the Shack 7. Um, they are six animal rights activists who were convicted in March of 2006 to um, 24 years in prison for, I'm quoting, using their website to incite hate, harassment, vandalism, and attacks against the company Huntington Life Sciences, who are running animal testing laboratories. In the words of their supporters on their website, um, they, they describe this as a website that reported on and expressed ideological support for protest activity against Huntington and its business affiliates. They were not accused of having been engaged in, in terrorist or threatening acts, but simply to, or simply well, but um, they were accused to conspire to promote terrorism. And for this are in prison, all of them, to t 24 years. Um, the law that, that is being used here mostly is a law that um, used to be called the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act and, and is now called the Animal Enterprise Protection Act, um, first introduced in 1992. Another uh, example is what is called the Operation Backfire. This is an investigation run by the FBI and they are actually calling this the Operation Backfire since 2004. Um, the FBI, and then there's differing information also on the FBI websites, if you dare to go there. Um, um, and my impression from this is that uh, they have been looking for a group called The Family for 10 years. Um, initially because uh, this, this group is said to have burned down a ski resort in Colorado, causing $26 million of damage. Um, in some reports, it says this caused $12 million of damage, um, either in, in 98 or 96. Um, and, and the activists who are members of this said group are, are either members of the Earth Liberation Front and or the Animal Liberation Front. They are accused of having done up to 25 actions of, of either $48, uh, dollars, uh, $48 million of, of damage or $80 million, there's again different information, doing uh, vandalism, property damage, animal releases, and arson. In 2004, local, state, and federal investigations were combined um, to this one investigation called the Operation Backfire. And um, I'm quoting again, the defendants are accused of attacks on federal land and animal management sites, private meat packing plants, lumber facilities, and a car dealership with damages here um, reaching $80 million. 
Um, so far, 17 people were indicted, um, and in these indictments, in these trials, um, 15 pled guilty of their actions. And so far, the FBI is still looking for four people to be members of this group, and there is a $50,000 reward per person set out for any information leading to arrest of these people. Um, another case... Um, and, and that's not a picture to the case, just another illustrating some of the material that is being produced by the supporters of these, of these um, cases. Another case is one that um, was um, sentenced also in 2008 is against a woman called Brianna Waters, who was sentenced to six years of prison for an arson attack against the university building in Washington state. She is, I think, 32 or maybe 33 years old now. She has a daughter of three years and, and um, is a violent teacher who, who used to live in California. And what describes her also is that she used to be the partner of one of the suspects in, in these arson cases who is um, still being, one, who is one of these four that is, are still looked for. She was arrested in 2005 and later released. Now she's serving a prison term. And the interesting thing about this case is that she herself says she's innocent. She, she was not involved in these attacks at all, but she was accused of someone who was also charged in the same case. And she was charged to be the lookout in an arson attack against the building of the University of Washington that um, comprised research um, facilities about uh, genetically modified trees. This, um, this charge could have led to a sentence of up to 35 years of prison. Um, and, and the interesting thing that I didn't know about the U.S. legal system before is that um, if you are accused of something and uh, you plead that, and you're saying you're, you're not guilty, you're innocent of the charge, then, then you might receive this full sentence of, of so many years. But if you agree to a deal with, with the prosecutor and the, and the court, then you can consider re reduce the possible sentence, either because you um, accept that you are guilty, which, which is um, something I still don't understand why being guilty reduces your sentence, but that works. And the other more important part is that um, if you agree to, to testify about other suspects, then this will also extremely reduce your sentence. And this is what happened in this case. Brianna Waters said she's innocent, she doesn't have to do anything with the attacks, but to other people who also were facing um, a minimum of 30 years of prison, um, testified about her and said she was involved and, and the res result was that um, one was then facing only three to five years and the other five to seven years of prison. Um, this is basically an invitation to lie about other people. And when you do, um, you will get a much lesser sentence, which um, is um, not a very nice thing to do, obviously. But then on the other hand, if you face 35 years or 50 years or hundreds of years in prison, and you are told, if you tell us this and that story, you might end up with just five or 10. I think it's very hard to point fingers. The result, however, is very hard. In this case, it's, it's Brianna Waters being in prison who, who said there is no evidence other than these um, testimonies and, uh, and, uh, and no other evidence that, that actually proves her to be involved. In the United States, and that I think is also very, very special here, is that there is a, a general atmosphere of fear. I think nobody of us would be surprised to hear about that. Already here, I talk to a lot of people who tell me, I'm scared to look at your website, I'm scared to call you, I'm scared to Google certain terms because I know all of this is being monitored. But in the US, I think this is, this is many times harder and many more tense. Um, there's, there's no fly lists that when you ever get targeted as, as somehow involved in suspicious activities, you may not be able to fly. There is um, one million people on the so-called terrorism watch list who, who have some kind of consequences. And, and it's very difficult to detect how you get to be um, on these lists. And, and it's even more difficult and practically impossible with legal uh, methods to get out of this again. So the result is that most people don't dare to, for example, um, express support when other people are concerned. Uh, a different case um, from the United States, apart from, from this, this green scare, 
Oh, well, this is also something that I thought was really quite amazing. That is, um, that is an anonymous ad uh, placed in different um, big uh, papers in the United States, um, um, which concerns the United New York uh, Stock Exchange and, and how this is being um, threatened by terrorism. The next case um, that I would like to talk about is the case against the Critical Art Ensemble, which some of you may have heard about. It's, um, it's a case that, was, that became known in 2004 when the Joint Terrorism Task Force detained the artist and professor Steve Kurtz of the Critical Art Ensemble, which is an art and theater collective. And what happened is that um, he was at home with his wife and, and she suddenly died during the night of a heart failure. He called the emergency number, emergency doctors came and they saw that there was material for an exhibition on biotechnology and, he, and, and, and the doctors called the police. Police instantly started a bioterrorism investigation, seized his computers, the exhibition that was planned to, to go um, in a museum in the next days, um, which included petri dishes and, and bacteria and many things that were considered um, possibly terrorist dangers. All of this just because his wife had died. It's not because he was, he was actually um, monitored with anything considered terrorist. Um, and, and was quite public about his art and exhibitions also in the past. His, his wife's body was confiscated during this investigation. Kurtz was released after 22 hours and later it was found that all material was harmless. Um, when the terrorism charges were dropped after a while, um, an investigation on a charge called mail and wire fraud was started instead, and, and this um, can lead up to 20 years of prison. Um, the Critical Art Ensemble is rather well known for exhibitions, books, and public debate on issues such as um, GMO, biotechnology, but also electronic civil disobedience and digital resistance. Um, there's many books they have written that are free for download on their website. What you're seeing up there is, um, is a picture to a film that was um, made by um, Lynn Hirschman, um, which is called Strange Culture, which is a great film that I advise you to see whenever you can. It's a mix of documentary and fiction about this case um, and, and extremely um, good to see. It describes very well the kind of fear that is created around a terrorism case um, when, when people are being called to testify against someone they know who has been arrested for terrorism charges, for example, and what it does to you and, and for your life when, when something like this just kind of drops on you. Similarity to, to Andre Holmes' case um, in this case is that it's a critical researcher who was, who was concerned and um, the case has, has been dismissed now in April of this year, but up until then, um, I think uh, Steve Kurtz's life was focusing on terrorism more than on his um, other activities. This takes us to France. France has a new phenomenon, the, um, the ultra-left. In November of this year, just one and a half months ago, 150 special police forces stormed a farm in a little village of 350 inhabitants in Tarnac. And there were raids also in Paris, in Rouen, in Limoges and Metz. Ten people were detained. Um, and four days later, this, this detention, this first detention after arrest can take up to four, four days. And four days later, five of them were formally arrested and five others were released. One of them was the mother of one of the arrested. And they were charged, the five who were arrested, with criminal conspiracy with terrorist intentions. The accusation is uh, property damage against the French train company SNCF, which caused delays for trains, and they were using what is called grapnels to damage the overhead contact wire. It's a kind of, of metal instrument that is hung over the overhead wires, and when the train goes in, this causes the wires to break and to come down, and then the train can't go on. Three days before the arrests um, was the night when the Castor transport with nuclear waste um, was moving from France to Germany. You may remember this in the news. Um, and um, then such an attack took place. And another had, had also taken place in October, which caused delays of high-speed trains, the TGV. 
Um, and um, in, the, in the second of these, of these incidents on the 8th of November, um, the traffic of regional trains in the north of Paris was the result. The French, um, no, the Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben published uh, a text about the arrests in Liberation, which is um, a, a leftist liberal daily paper in France, and I would like to quote from this text. As for the result, one might expect that investigators found weapons, explosives, and Molotov cocktails on the farm in Milvache. Far from it. The SDAT, that's the Special Terrorism um, Police, SDAT officers discovered documents containing detailed information on railway transportation, including exact arrival and departure times of trains. <laughs> In plain French, an SNCF train schedule. But they also confiscated climbing gear. In simple French, a ladder, such as one might find in any country house. On the 2nd of December, um, some three weeks later, three of the remaining five were released um, and now still in detention is the so-called leader of this um, criminal organization with terrorist intentions who is called Julien Coupa and his partner Eldune. The leader still faces up to 20 years in prison now with this charge. And, um, just two days ago he had an appeal in, in court and was denied release. Also here, the reason, the reason given by the prosecutor and the Minister for Internal Affairs is anarchist political ideas and um, contact to protest activities. There was an observation going on for six months before the arrests. Um, some asked questions like, if they were having this observation going on against these people, how would they manage to do these attacks against the train companies? And nobody has answered that so far. Um, they were not actually caught in these attacks. They were just accused of having taken part in them. No weapons were found. So far, no evidence for participation in the sabotage became known. Instead, um, like I said, the train schedules, ladders, bolt cutters, or iron parts were found. Also, it was um, mentioned in the arrest warrants that, uh, that the accused took part in a demonstration against the summit about immigration in Vichy earlier this year. Also, it is mentioned several times that there is a book um, which uh, was possibly written by Julien Coupa and, and it can be obtained legally by also, I think, through Amazon or at least in bookstores. But, but having um, possibly written this book or actually having this book at home and having read it um, is, is used as evidence against the suspects. It's interesting to, to understand that in April of, of this year, the Minister of Internal Affairs talks about uh, the danger of anarcho-autonoms and the new ultra-left. Before, she also theorized about the danger of a revival of armed struggle in Paris or France at such. Um, there is a wide public debate in France going on. There is another similarity here also with the case against André Holmes since one of the suspects, the leader of the organization, is actually a, a philosopher um, himself and, and closely tied to, um, to, to uh, elite university for social science in Paris. There is a lot of, of debate um, amongst philosophers about this. There is an open letter and a petition um, in his support signed by many academics. And there is a public debate in, in the media about this. Um, what is terrorism? A debate that we had in Germany about a year ago also and which keeps coming back. It is said that in times of the attacks of Bombay, is, is these, uh, these sabotage activities against trains, is that terrorism? This is one of the posters um, being done in support of, of, the, of the suspects. There is also an open letter by the, by the parents of those who are accused who, who protest against um, their, their children being made to terrorists without any visible evidence actually being there. It's maybe also interesting to note that, um, that this took place in this very little village somewhere in the middle of nowhere where um, since 2002 young people came to, to this lonely area that was more and more deserted and uh, opened a little grocery store, reactivated a farm and mostly concentrated on, on political activity. Yes, legal open political activity plus living in this area and um, taking care of themselves basically. 
the similarities, like I said, I think are quite, quite obvious. And my time is running short. Um, I'm coming with this, I'm coming to, this is one of the arrests in that case. Um, coming to cases in Germany that I want to quickly um, just um, mention. There was a case, um, a very similar case in Germany that was started um, in 1999 also involving these grapnels, these metal things on the overhead wires of trains um, relating to Castro transports of nuclear waste. Um, that took place in 1996 and 1997 and, and the result was um, one of the well-known paragraph 129A investigations raids in 1992 um, against 11 suspects and nine so-called concerned persons. It was never quite clear what, what their role was. This involved complete um, um, surveillance, um, surveillance of phone GPS devices in cars, some um, uh, copy machine that was used by one um, anti-nuclear activist group was, was completely monitored. Um, and all national meetings of the anti-nuclear movement in Germany were completely observed by the police. The case was dropped years later without any result, but a lot of data was gathered about um, many of the political activists in Germany. Interesting here is that now the German police submit names and information about this case to the French police who are investigating the case in Tarnac in France. Um, there's other cases um, that I'll just quickly mention. Um, the, the terrorism investigation concerning the G8 summit in Germany, which was started. The, the G8 summit, you will remember this, was taking place in 2007 in Germany, in Heiligendamm. And there was a so-called um, terrorist organization aiming to, to um, destroy, to attack the, the economic uh, G8 summit. Um, one month before the summit, um, there were raids um, in 40 places. It was an investigation against 18 people who were submitted to complete surveillance. Um, when the raids took place, there was a police officer quoted on German TV saying, well, we, he didn't say that they didn't have clear evidence, but what he did say was that we, well, we just shot in the bush to see what starts to move when we try to stir up things a little bit. There was no, no evidence at all, just the assumption that there is this, this organization. This case was dropped in 2008, um, actually some days before the start of the trial against the, the, the three people who are now actually currently assumed to be the militant group. Another case, which is called the, the Bad Oldes Lohe case, was started in 2006 as well against um, the first four and later 11 people raids in 15 apartments, and it's a case against uh, young anti-fascists who all live in, in a little place in the north of Germany called Bad Oldesloe, um, who, who were not interested in the G8 summit, which was rather rare, rare among political activists in Germany one year before the summit, because most everybody somehow tried to relate to this um, summit protest activities, which were clear to become quite big. But these anti-fascists were not interested in the G8 summit, they were interested in, in fascists and anti-fascist activities in their village, and, and this was seen to be highly conspiratorial and very suspicious by the police. If they never talked about the G8 summit on the phone, then they must have extremely conspiratorial methods of communicating um, to hide their interest in the G8 summit. The initial, initial suspicion uh, was against a couple that um, had, had both their mobile phones active in the same radio cell an attack took place. They were actually accused of also attacking um, military vehicles and, and setting them on fire, I think. Um, another really hilarious story in this context is that one of the uh, suspects used to have um, dreadlocks, like these, these long funny hair, and at some point during the investigation he cut them off. And, and you can find in the files a note about this incident uh, when the German police um, tries to interpret why he has his hair cut off. And the only <laughs> The only possible interpretation they can think he must have been involved in some kind of arson attack and then he probably burned his hair to hide that he cut them off. There is no evidence, no proof for this, it's just a theory, but this is being put in the files and then used against them. 
What you see here um, up there is, is a, a GPS device that was found um, in one of the cars or under one of the cars of the defendants that became quite popular because um, it was found by the suspects and then through the lawyer that tried to give it back to the police, but the police said, it's not ours. And the Secret Service says, mm -mm, not ours. And so they said, well, we have this thing and nobody claims it's theirs. What do we do? Well, we keep it. And after a while, they were actually starting an investigation against the person who had found that thing for illegal possession of this um, GPS device. <laughs> which was then dropped by the judge in court who said, well, if nobody claims it's theirs, it can't be um, illegally obtained or possessed. Um, and the, the quotations in that thing, I advise you to research that. It's, it's nice to read, except probably for the people concerned who still have it and nobody wants, wants to have it back. Um, and the last um, thing I want to mention is, is the several cases against uh, people who are accused of being the militant group in Germany. Um, the first case was, um, became known in 2001 against first three people, later five people, um, with uh, raids um, in six places over the years. Um, they had complete surveillance, GPS, bugs in their apartments, video cameras outside their, their homes, phone and email monitored, listening devices uh, during conversations. Andre also had this um, when they try to follow a conversation between a suspect and another suspect. Um, civil close police um, take, take microphones and, and listening devices and try to follow them, for example, into a bar and try to listen to the conversation. And this also happened um, in this first case against the militant group. Um, there's, I think there's um, three different sets of files against different kinds of people who were accused to be militant group. Um, Andre and, and three others being the fourth set of people um, who were said to be militant group. The first three cases, interestingly enough, were now finally closed just before the trial against the last group of, of, of three people who are currently uh, said to be militant group after Andre was accused to be militant group. Um, and so the first three sets uh, were closed just some days before the trial was opened. And this trial is actually still going on now in the uh, Berlin um, court in Moabit um, and, and that in itself would fill a complete talk about very strange details um, how this how this trial is being led. I'm not going into that because I only have five minutes left and maybe you want to ask some questions. Interesting detail still is that um, in all of the files to the different cases of the militant group there's 2,000 people's names in the files who were at some point or the other checked by the police for criminal record or political activities. The last set um, we found when um, just some weeks ago we were handed over 82 new um, folders of files um, concerning Andre Holm. And it is widely believed that after the federal court in Germany decided that militant group is not a terrorist group that the case against Andre was dropped. Far from it. The investigation is still going on. He is still being um, under surveillance, probably. We are not being told about the details of this, but uh, recently got all of these new files that show quite clearly that we are being monitored quite closely, including public events that we do. Um, also outside the country, and it is visible in the files that um, both Secret Service, which is Verfassungsschutz, and, um, and the Federal Police are reading my blog to understand better about where we are and what we do. Um, and, um, for example, what really quite um, irritated me, even though it's not surprising to hear that um, an address book uh, with many phone numbers was found on my desk during the raid of our apartment and all people in there, old school friends, colleagues, whoever was closely checked by the police, noted whether they have some kind of police record and whatever else activities they may have engaged in. One really interesting little last detail that I would like to, to add is um, that we found in the files that uh, the German police found several encrypted files on Andre's computer. And uh, we are happy to announce that the federal police in Germany apparently is not able to decrypt GNUPG files. <laughs> The
There's an interesting um, communication when the federal police is, is looking at the files and wondering what they are and looking at the kind of, of files they are. They, after a while, detect them, this must be PGP. Um, and then they try to find out how to decrypt this kind of thing. And, um, and they are told that there is this professor at the Department of Information Systems and Information Management at the University of Cologne, Professor Dr. Detlef Schoder, and they ask him for help to decrypt the files, and Professor Schoder um, offers um, to send his assistant, Martin Wundram, to have a look at several encrypted files found on Andre's computer. Professor Schoder, just for looking at the files, not for attempting to decrypt them, just for looking at this, wanted to charge the, the federal police 5,000 euro. Um, the federal police in Germany said, <clears throat> so what are you going to do? Is this going to be successful? And then the professor said that, well, um, he has some powerful machines trying to decrypt, and actually it must be admitted that they also found Andre's private key on this computer. Um, but with this private key, what he was going to do is basically guess passphrases. Um, and, and said that if the passphrases are any longer than eight characters, and if they contain any special characters, it's practically impossible to decrypt. So now you know <laughs> how to save your files. <laughs> Pass phrases longer than eight signs and special characters and you can be considered pretty safe. The federal police uh, dropped the offer, didn't want to waste the 5,000 euro and um, we don't know what they are doing with these encrypted files so far. Um, just some quick conclusions um, to what I've told you this far. Um, I think there is um, a public perception of, of what terrorism is. So this public perception is fed daily by politicians and by the media. It creates fear of bomb attacks, of biological or chemical attacks against the wide public in Europe or North America and most everywhere in the world. The public perception of terrorism is, is um, I think, one that uh, involves many deaths similar to the legal definition which says terrorism intimidates the populations, it threatens governments or states. It's something like 9-11 or the bomb attacks on Madrid or, or London. But this hardly ever takes place, at least in Europe or North America. When we look at, at uh, Central Asia, this is an entirely different thing, but that's not what people are afraid of here. On the other hand, there is a lot of anti-terrorist prosecution taking place. This includes many trials and also prison terms for people and surveillance against a huge number of people. These cases hardly ever involve violence against people, with some exceptions uh, that, that have a long tradition and history, for example, the ETA in the Basque country or the, um, the, the Corsican um, uh, groups uh, that are trying to separate from France. But I think all the other cases would not be considered to be terrorist by, by most people. What, we're, what is not comprised by this definition of terrorism is right-wing violence, which happens so much and, and kills so many people, but this also is not being labeled as terrorist, even though I would consider that by far more terrorist than attacks against trains or, or um, um, even maybe setting fire to, to laboratories, which is debatable, no doubt, but, but also doesn't endanger people and doesn't kill anyone. What is similar in these investigations, um, as more so I can talk about Germany here because I don't know the details about the other countries, is that I have the impression that the investigations often look to prove their case and they interpret all possible evidence against the suspects. If, if you show some behavior that contradicts the suspicion, e.g. you don't talk about special subject, you're not interested in certain things, you don't uh, have anything to do with certain people who are facing the same charges, the only possible interpretation for the police, police can be that you are extremely conspiratorial about it, that you must have certain ways that um, make it necessary to even enforce more observation and more surveillance to find out your terrorist activity. And there is no, um, no visible evidence. It means the suspects must be working harder to hide suspicious or criminal behavior. I think in public perception, terrorism 
now is perceived as fundamentalist Islamic terrorism. The terrorism investigations that are going on here now concern groups and individuals who express political dissent, who are involved in political actions and sometimes property damages, and sometimes even with a lot of financial damage, but without people being hurt or being killed. There is no comparison, for example, to the attack in Oklahoma City in 1995 when 168 people were killed. Europol counts 583 cases of terrorist attacks in the European Union in 2007. This is from the Europol report on terrorist attacks in, uh, uh, in Europe in 2007. Uh, more of 500 of these are so-called separatist attacks, mostly, like I said, by ETA and the Corsican movements, but also 15 in Germany. When I saw that, I wondered, 15 separatist terrorist attacks in 2007 in Germany? How did I miss that? <laughs> interesting theory. Um, looking at the report, um, um, I found out that these 15 attacks are, are said to have been done by the PKK, the Kurdish um, um, by now illegal um, party in, in Germany, mostly against Turkish travel agencies and such. <laughs> I was wondering about Frisians, for example, or the Sorbs, but Bavaria is also an interesting theory. <laughs> there is an, a graph which was done by the magazine Der Spiegel and, and is still on their website now, and their interpretation of, of terrorist attacks in Europe comprises exactly two, and that's the one in Madrid and the one in London and, and no other terrorism. That's the different perceptions of terrorism that is taking place today in Europe. I think the public debate about terrorism causes a lot of fear and it allows more and tighter laws and more surveillance against everyone. Terrorism cases are often cases against either people of Arabic background or political activists or critical researchers who deal with topics considered to be suspicious. Often the terrorism charges dropped quickly, like you saw in the cases I talked about, but the investigations go on, the data are collected, and a lot of fear in the population is created through the first announcement of again 10 violent terrorists who have been arrested. My perception of terrorism is exactly that, the public debate that intimidates the population and undermines democracy. And that's where I'm ending now. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot for the great talk. And um, we run a wee bit of short, short of time here. Maybe we have, can we have three questions? And if you could just pass, pass around the mic wherever you see a hand coming up. And um, if there are no questions, that's, that's good too, but if there probably are. Um, do you know the case of terrorism uh, in Cologne? There were two suspects arrested at the airport after uh, being searched and there was some uh, letter found, apparently some kind of, well, I'm going to blow myself up. And um, the, the BKA uh, officially statement that, they're, uh, that they have been monitoring them for months and that they're evil terrorists and so on. Uh, later on, turns out that was just a love letter from his uh, girlfriend. Uh. Yes, of course, there's so many cases like that and I just could pick some very few and you could go on for, forever. I'm, I'm writing about these things in my blog and I've also mentioned this case. I find it extremely interesting because it concerns again two Arab men who uh, were arrested with a huge public um, announcement and later they were released because no, no evidence was found. Exa it, it's exactly one of those cases. Is there uh, another hand? Can you just, like, just start to speak as soon as you've got the mic. Okay. Um, all right. You can just come up here if you like. That's probably easier. 
Hi. Um, my name's Star Simpson. I was arrested in Boston uh, in 2007 and charged with possession of a hoax device, which consisted officially of 13 LEDs. Um, hearing your talk has made me think that there ought to be some sort of tool or way of helping people who find themselves in these situations, because in my experience and possibly also in yours, it's impossible to predict or see it coming, and the thing you need most is help. So I'd like to pose to the Congress uh, thoughts on what can be done. Excellent idea. I think a support network that, that helps people when, when they are all of a sudden faced with something like that is extremely needed. Well, thank you for your talk. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot for coming and um, yeah, the next talk will, will be up soon. Also, if I may add, I'm going to be here in the next day, so if you have more questions or something you want to say, maybe not in public, you can just come to me and talk to me or send me an email. My mail address is also in my blog. Thank you very much.